Uh, thank you for coming. I know it's very late, so we'll be as quick as possible. Hopefully, you will find it uh, useful. Uh, I would like to discuss for something which is very dear to us is the time series recipe we have designed and implemented with uh, my colleague and co-partner in, in Kaggle. Uh, for people that don't know my background, I used to be ranked uh, number one on Kaggle, and actually Matthias used to be ranked at fourth, and this is a snapshot of our profiles. Uh, it may not be very visible, but we have actually participated uh, in, together in more like 150 competitions, which is, which is quite a lot. We have spent a lot of time trying to optimize for different problems. We have spent quite a lot of time on time series, and we try to take that knowledge and fit that in. Also, great opportunity to thank, again, Matthias, because I, think I, would, I don't think I would have done it without his help. So thank you very much. Uh, I would like to, although I believe most of you have already seen how driverless AI works very quickly, uh, it's, it's very simple. You have some input data, you have some variables, and you have a target which you want to predict. And for time series, the setup is actually the same. So you try to predict this Y, this target variable. And then you define an objective function, something you want to optimize. Let's say minimize a type of error or maximize some form of accuracy. And once you have defined this metric, then you just allocate some resources. You put some time constraints. And obviously, based on the hardware available in your computer, driverless AI will run for a certain number of iterations. And then it will start giving you outputs. These outputs may be. Uh, some visualizations about the data. And the interesting thing about the visualization, it, it capitalizes on patterns which are interesting, so it's not going to show you everything. It's going to show you uh, graphs which have something to tell. Uh, it automates the feature engineering process and feature selection, and that, as in many other problems, is extremely important in time series too, although the feature engineering is slightly different than the one you've seen so far. Uh, obviously, there is an automated selection of models uh, and, and the tuning of their hyperparameters. And then we include an interpretability module, which is essentially an explanation, uh, often visual, uh, with other means too, uh, that tries to tell you why the model is giving the predictions it does. And obviously, you can export this whole pipeline into a single, uh, for example, Python package, and you can implement it all in one go. So what is a time series problem? This is a bit repetitive with what I've said yesterday, but let me go through it quickly. Uh, it's essentially when the target variable demonstrates a significant, important relationship with time. That relationship might be very straightforward, like the one you see here, something very linear. So the more time goes by, the more sales increase or decrease. Or it could be something uh, very seasonal, all non-linear, something that goes up and down through time, um, which might be a bit more tricky. Uh, but more realistically, quite often, look something like the graph I'm showing you now, so that, so that we are all on the same page. Uh, our recipe capitalizes on trying to identify the time groups which are embedded within your data. Uh, sometimes you keep a data set which might have multiple values for the same dates, and that's because you have different overlapping groups. For example, different stores that, or different products that show sales for the same day. It is extremely important to be able to clean this up and clearly define these groups, because then we can extract features which are specific to each one of these essentially unique time series. Obviously, uh, you, as you see, all the groups so slightly different behavior, but at the same time, we can find common ground to combine information from all these time series in order to improve the ones who have slightly less information. Our general modeling framework takes into account certain hyperparameters. We assume that the training data span over a period of time, which could be, uh, uh, you can think of them as some time units. That time units could be days, could be minutes, seconds, weeks, years, months. Uh, it doesn't matter. In this example, uh, it, it could be months. So the training data spans over a period, let's say nine months. And then, quite often, you have a gap period, a period where you don't have access to the data. 
And then you have a period after this, which is essentially the period w w that you try to predict. This is your, ter your test period. Sometimes you have no gap in the data, but our SCP is comfortable in taking into account that there will be a gap of information between the period you have data and the period where you actually try to predict. The whole period you try to predict is essentially the 11 and 12th week in this example, and we call it the forecast horizon. And it is important to differentiate, uh, to, to, to be able to define this forecast horizon because not all points into the future are equal. For example, for the 11th month, we can see back two months. We have available data from month nine, but for uh, month 12, we have available data three months ago. So we don't know what happened in level, we don't know what happened in 10, but we do know what happened in nine. So it is important to specify this horizon so that the model can optimize for this and picks for you the right, the correct ranges to find the right features and optimize for your problem. And the way we construct our data is essentially we take that test window and we try to replicate it within our data. So we will take the most recent uh, window with the same forecast horizon, in this case two months, we will apply a gap and then we will start generating features be that, that look in the past from before that point. So essentially, we try to replicate what we try to, what you try to predict. And we do that multiple times because we want to make certain that we optimize and we pick the right models that come as close as possible to what the algorithms are really being tested on. Uh, we have different validation schemas that can help us to achieve that goal of getting a very generalizable model. And here I just picked a, a time series from a specific uh, uh, store that shows different sales. A, a very typical way, the most simple actually to construct the validation is just take the most recent window that has the same size as the test data and use the remaining for training data. Uh, again, here you make the assumption that the most recent data will be closer to the actual test data because they are the nearest in, in, in the future. Uh, a slightly different approach, which may be more robust, is to have rolling windows of adjusting sites from the training data. So you start, again, this, the first approach is actually the same as the one you, you, you used before but then you start rolling your validation window by equal sizes, each time using less training data, but applying exactly the same feature engineering approach in order to predict a model that is able to achieve good results in all these windows using different training data, less training data each time, able to give you robust results, uh, it is very likely to be a very generalizable and strong model. Um, uh, yeah, and a different way to do this is to uh, do an equal size of rolling windows. So not use all available information for training, but constrain it so that even the training window has exactly the same size as validation, where you keep moving that forward. Similar, similar with the other one, but the training size is adjusted to fall into the validation size. And another approach is to keep taking different random uh, validation and train windows, which are obviously sequential, uh, in order to uh, make a model that is robust against any time frame. So we use these different approaches in driverless and we try to pick the best one depending on the situation, the type of your data, how much data your test uh, period spans to, and, and some other uh, parameters. And now it's it's good to move into the feature engineering, which is a very exciting part, but my colleague, Matthias, is going to take over. Can you remove that? I can try. But if that, you yeah, can yeah. keep it, you can keep it. Okay, I'll take this it. one. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, um, regarding feature engineering, so um, what is in driverless AI? So that's basically what I'm talking about. Um, first of all, we have some basic feature engineering. Um, like if you have a date, we extract um, simple things like what's the day, what's the month, what's the year, uh, features like that. We have also, which is a new addition, we extract if it's a holiday or not, um, because on certain types of data, um, that's really valuable information to have. 
And that's also information we can create for our test data sets, so that's a good feature. And we will create it. Um, another thing is um, legs. So um, our legs-based recipe is, of course, um, heavily um, based on uh, creating legs and um, creating features on past information. So we, of course, we never look into the future, but we look a, a lot into the past and extract legs. So what we do, for instance, um, if we have a date and sales, um, then we look back. So what were the sales like um, last day, two days ago, et cetera. And with those legs, what we can do is we can also create uh, moving averages. Here's a simple example where we take just the mean of, uh, of two legs, but um, in driver AI we have um, EWMAs for general sizes, and we can also create uh, an order differentiated legs. So um, if we take the legs, create them, um, subtract the means, and then only after that creating the, the averages, um, we can do a lot of aggregation of legs, so mean, standard, sums, et cetera, counts of the past. Um, we can create interaction of legs, so simple example would just to subtract two specific ones, um, but there are other uh, functions included, um, not only subtraction. And uh, another thing is uh, linear regression on legs, so what you do is you create a bunch of legs and you create a linear model on them and taking something like slope and intercept as a new feature uh, for your current world. Um, right. Um, and one question uh, that we get often asked, okay, how do we uh, create uh, the candidates for our leg sizes? So how do we choose internally what kind of leg sizes to look at? Um, and the first method is we create a ranking based on autocorrelation. So we, um, yeah, basically, computes out a correlation for each leg size, uh, which is possible, because what is possible, uh, we know that because of the length of the training uh, data set, and eventually we have the test data set of the user inputs a specific forecast horizon. So we have that information, so we can compute it for every uh, possible value and uh, rank them based on autocorrelation. Um, Another thing is we have predefined intervals based on the estimated fre uh, frequency. So what happens if you put a time series into driverless is that it identifies the main frequency of the timestamps of the individual time series. Um, and based on that, we have basically simple lookup tables. For instance, for daily data, it makes sense to look at um, every week or every two weeks and so on. Uh, and the same holds for weekly data. You can say, okay, um, maybe let's look at, at every two weeks, every four weeks. Um, and based on uh, those predefined intervals, uh, we can now uh, take subsets of those and aggregate them and simply apply all the other uh, feature engineering transformers on subsets of that, and so we can um, pick up seasonal patterns, for instance. Um, and yeah, that's just uh, an indicator that we have set for uh, many different frequencies and if you have a very, uh, very um, uncommon frequency, like maybe um, gigahertz or something, then it will just um, fall back to um, all possible leg sizes and the genetic algorithm to, uh, still tries to figure out what is good leg sizes. We have still ways to, um, we can still do the autocorrelation, so it's simply uh, several modules, several strategies all combined and the genetic algorithm figures out what's useful. Um, another thing is um, sometimes if you create legs, um, then they are too powerful. You have, um, in general, much more information in the training than you have for validation or test. And um, the first strategy to, uh, to counter overfitting uh, is to low lower the bound of considered leg sizes. So let's say we have a forecast horizon um, of four weeks and we want to create a leg of one week, then we can only do that for the very first week in our test set. So 75% of our legs for the test set would be NAN information. Um, but what we can also do, we can say, okay, uh, that leg size is too small, don't create it at all. That's the first strategy. Another one is, okay, 
I have now created leg size of one for my testing data set, so I have 75% um, NANDs. And I do the same process for, for my training data set, but because it's much longer and a, uh, a lot more months can actually look one month back, we have much less NANDs, which is a bad thing. So let's just drop out and align those frequencies so that we have exactly the same relatively frequency of uh, uh, non-available information in train as in test. And the third uh, strategy is to do dark target binning before we lag. So an, instead of lagging the actual target, we lag bins or bin values, and that decreases the um, possible amount of splits GBM can perform. Currently, driverless heavily relies on GBM, um, also for time series, um, and that's why we have such a strategy implemented. Uh, another quick note is that we're working on a um, MLI module for time series. So and that's especially help, helpful if you want to explain your predictions. So what you can do, you can click on your prediction, you see the actuals as well, so you can compare how good is it. And then you see, uh, see uh, Shapley values uh, of those predictions, so you can actually see, okay, what actually uh, has driven this prediction? So was it a holiday, was it a specific lag, uh, something like that? Um, and in the current, in the new version, 1.4, uh, there's an alpha version of, of this model uh, included. It's still in a really early um, state, but you can already have a look. And I want to uh, finish my talk with um, the roadmap, because um, there's a lot uh, what we plan for the future. Uh, one is uh, data augmentation at time of prediction. Um, fancy name, but what it actually means is that consider you have like um, a data set with a lot of stores, weekly sales of them, and you have really a lot of stores, for whatever reason you have millions of them, and you want to train only of a subset of them, like let's say half, but you still want to predict all of them. And uh, what you can do, you can, um, what the plan is that you can provide historical data at prediction time, and so basically postpone to the training, and then you can still forecast those stores which uh, haven't been seen yet in train. Another one is signal processing and classification. That's actually another uh, uh, problem domain, if you want so. Um, it's instead of having a label for each time point, uh, you have one label for each time group. In this example, it would be groups A and B. And you actually want to, they have all the same target, right? So as a, as a group, per se, as a target, like let's say A is a bad signal and B is a good signal, and in order to, to make a, a model out of it, uh, we have to transform the frame, the data, uh, and create features on each uh, time series uh, individually. Let's say we go into the frequency domain and extract some, uh, extract some features there, doing sliding window aggregates, count zero crossing, extract some peak patterns, et cetera, or what you can do there. Um, that's a big domain, and uh, I think that will be also really useful for some users. Um, another one is that um, we will add uh, more algorithms like uh, profit from Facebook. We have it already implemented. We're just waiting for the license to change. Um, that will happen soon, hopefully, and then we can um, put it out. And also some classical methods like Avima, for instance, so more traditional approaches. Um, because currently, we, as, I, as I mentioned, we um, rely on gradient boosting, which is fine for a lot of data sets but it's not optimal for all, so let's just bring them together. And if you have that, we can also, of course, assembling. Uh, we're always a fan of that, so that will be an option as well. Um, and finally, uh, finally um, iterative learning. Um, so it's another way to deal with the problem that if you have long forecast horizons and um, you train only one holistic model that you can't create, um, enough legs or short legs for, for long forecast horizons. But what you can do, you can train iterative models, so only predict one time ahead, and then use the predictions, lag source predictions, um, and then you can uh, in, enhance the predictions on the very last points in time. And yeah, 
many more probably. It's always a changing. We uh, listening to customer feedback and um, trying to figure out what's actually needed out there. Um, so if you have any suggestions, if you uh, want anything in, tell us. And yeah, so thank you for your attention. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, a few questions came up. So do you reverse temporal order in time-based CV? I'm guessing as in using future to predict fast. That's very interesting. Actually, sometimes it works, but no, we don't do it currently. Might be a bit cheeky, but it is an interesting concept. Uh, can you specify the gap horizon in Travelers AI manually? Yes, you can. But if you provide a test data set, it will be picked up automatically for you. You still have the option to add this option. Why is there a gap period at all? Why not use all the data available of the past to predict the future? That's interesting. It was asked yesterday, too. Uh, that's just because it happens that sometimes you don't have all the latest data available. If you have, then yes, you don't need a gap. And it is better not. Uh, no, it's always better not to have one, but sometimes that's not the case. You don't have the latest data available at, at prediction time. That's why you need to incorporate that gap in your data so as the model to learn to expect that you might have some recent missing information. It just, you know, happens. It's, it's, it might be expensive or costly to have the most updated data available at scoring time. Does the model understand the meaning of months or these are just column names? Yes, it does understand. So based on the, on, I'm not sure actually what you mean here. Maybe you can find me afterwards, but from a date, it can derive these attributes clearly and, and, and understand the concept. Uh, do you also use cross-sectional regressions to generate features for panel data? Mm, okay, that's an interesting one. Um, uh, the short answer is uh, no. The short answer is no. I mean, we we essentially use panel regressions, right, to generate, and we take some features from these panel regressions to use as features. But I wouldn't say we strictly um, take certain periods to run a regression using. Uh, maybe good to find me after, which actually I'm not 100% certain about what you mean here. Uh, can you make the music off in the room next to us? I wish I had this power. Uh, are you going to add LSTM in driverless AI at some time? Uh, yes, it is actually in the roadmap. It will be added sooner or later. How much data do you need to create a reasonable time series forecast model? For example, is one year of daily data enough? Very tough question. That depends on the problem. Uh, um, uh, generally, it, it's always good to have your observations spanning into thousands of numbers, but at the end of the day, you have to do the best that you can with, you know, like what you have. So if it is one year, then one year. I mean, I wouldn't say it's ideal, but it, it, it works. Uh, I cannot, I cannot, uh, it's tough to comment this because it, it, it depends on the problem. Uh, how do you account for seasonality within time series forecast? I mean, we hope we capture this by either selecting the right lag features and we also introduce some other variables in the form of you know what day of the month it is uh, if it is a holiday so we have some features which may may help us to to point out periods that we might expect some outburst in in the target variable um, in your examples, the SKUs or stores you mentioned have history. How about new SKUs and stores with not history? Forecast will be year, zero? No. So the way it works, the way we generate lags, we generate it for all possible groups, uh, but we also generate it for no groups. So we do create features which may mean the overall mean or just the overall mean of yeah, SKU, or the overall mean of a, of a store and a SKU. So uh, at the very worst, that prediction will have as a feature the overall mean and not then a zero, but we also take into account other features, as I said, which might be a bit more static, like you know day of the week or 
uh, month or you know, if it is a holiday information which can be available uh, when you try to predict in the future. So your predictions will be shaped by these features too. Uh, I'm a bit cautious about the time, so I think it's good if, if, if we stop it here and you can always find me afterwards for the remaining of the, of the questions, if that makes sense. Thank you very much for your time.